Albrecht Dürer, whom his contemporaries called the German Leonardo, was born in Nuremberg, a rich center of transit trade between Italy and the Netherlands. Albrecht's father was a jeweler, and his godfather became Anton Koberger, a renowned publisher and owner of a big typography enterprise. It was with the typography of his godfather that young Dürer learned the practice of wood engraving, from its cutting to printing. Later, having grown into a great master, he proved to be a skillful painter as well as a brilliant draftsman and theorist, experienced in geometry and fortification. But his predominant interest lay in engraving. He achieved complete perfection when mastering its techniques. Dürer finished his big print, the Nemesis, copper engraving, when he was 30, and he gained esteem as an influential master. His studies in his native Nuremberg were finished with a traditional tour of other German lands. And on his return home and marriage, he continued his travels, departing for Italy, where he stayed for six months. Nemesis can be considered as an allegorical image of justice, but being divided from such works as the Hermitage's Christ in Majesty by only a few decades, this sheet is extremely far from the medieval consciousness. The ancient goddess is represented as soaring above the earth, standing on a ball, and holding an allegorical brimming bowl with gifts intended for courageous men who venture to go ahead, and simultaneously, in the other hand, a sword and a bridle for those overcome by the sin of arrogance. In the mountain landscape beneath the goddess's ball, one can recognize the small town of Clausen in Tyrol. Dürer passed through this country on his way to Italy. While using only combinations of lines of various length and thickness, the great German master was capable of rendering subtle gradations of tone and creating a feeling of plasticity and the material reality of objects. The motif of death was persistent in German art of the period, appealing to man to be vigilant toward all seductions against his spiritual purity. Christian morals became the chief theme of public life in Germany on the eve of the Reformation. The motif of Venus acquired here quite different significance than in Italy, because it was traditionally connected with the sin of voluptuousness, one of the seven cardinal sins. During Christmas, there were popular performances in the German towns. One of their personages, the so-called Frau Venus, seduced men by witchcraft in order to ruin them later. Is this the cause of the strange treatment of the pictorial environment in Cronach's painting? The stripe of dry, stony soil breaks just behind the figures, as if pushing against the black, impenetrable background and evoking suddenly the suggestion of the gloom of non-existence. The motif of the cranium was often included in compositions of portraits or painted on their back. Such an image as the cranium in the niche by Barthel Brain was probably the back of a portrait or formed a diptych with the latter. There is no shield which would prevent us from death Therefore, live as if you want to meet your death. Such an inscription the painter made on this painting. These moral warnings were the usual subject of Protestant preachings, as they were founded by Protestant leader Martin Luther. Cronach's ideal of the perfect woman was inspired by a real person, Katharina von Bora, Martin Luther's wife. This is suggested by the clear likeness between her appearance 
and that of Mary in Cronach's painting, The Virgin and Child Under an Apple Tree. It is one of the most poetic images in the art of the German Renaissance. Cronach's Madonna recalls a blonde-haired princess from an old German fairy tale. Little Christ holds bread and an apple in his hands, and these objects are here to symbolize the act of the fall and that of redemption, thanks to Christ's sacrificial death. Only these sacred symbols are reminiscent of the theme of the Passion. The dominant mood of the painting is determined by Mary's tender gesture with which she supports the child and her thoughtful facial expression. Her long and curly reddish hair softly runs down the shoulders while the sumptuous twigs of the apple tree frame her head as a kind of crown. In the distance we can see a beautiful fairy tale landscape. The unknown subject of this portrait, thoughtful and deprived of spectacular pose and appearance, differs quite considerably from the proud personages of Italian portraiture. Immersed in his thoughts, he apparently doesn't notice anybody or anything from the majestic architectural environment. Being a renowned master of altarpieces and paintings on religious subjects, Holbein also executed a good deal of portraits and portrait drawings. Among them, there is a double portrait of his sons, which distinguishes itself by its surprisingly subtle minute delineation. Some time later, Holbein's sons themselves became outstanding draftsmen. There is no shield which would prevent us from death. Therefore, live as if you want to meet your death. Such an inscription the artist made on this painting. It was supposed that originally the painting was a reverse side of the portrait, or formed together with the latter, a diptych. It is well known that Breen executed many such works, and some of them have survived to this day. Drawing was not an original form of artistic endeavor until the Renaissance epoch. One of the masters who made it independent from other arts was the outstanding German draftsman Wolf Huber, who left many landscape drawings and very few paintings in prints. The ancient goddess is represented as soaring above the earth, standing on a ball, and holding an allegorical brimming bowl with gifts intended for courageous men who venture to go ahead. Simultaneously, in the other hand, she holds a sword and a bridle for those overcome by the sin of arrogance.
The central image of this masterpiece can be considered symbolically as a knight fighting for the Christian faith, but also the metaphorical aspect of Durer's imagery played its part, for there is an evident connection with the epistles of the Apostle Paul. St. Paul taught Christians to put on a belt of truth and an armor of pious life, to take a shield of faith, a helmet of salvation, and a sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Durer represented this moral lesson to a true Christian, whose readiness to overwhelm all dangers testing his spirit could be equated to a knight's readiness for fierce battle or to follow his true path. No other engraving of that period represented so faithfully the sunlight as this masterpiece of Durer. The light, which acts like a spiritual substance, is running through windows, enveloping the objects now stronger, now softer, and the sheet's space turns into a placid, warm, and luminous spiritual aura. <laughs> Representations of four allegorical images of the people's temperaments were known already in the art of Middle Ages. The melancholic temperament distinguished itself by the gesture of a hand supporting the head in deep pensiveness. The same gesture can be seen in the print of Durer, but all other details of this surround reveal the extremely personal and complicated imagery of the artist. The nude body of Venus, accurately modeled with transparent light colors and clear soft outline, seems to stand out from the background. We feel the strange, ambiguous character of this image, both its attractive and alarming substance. A Moore's look, while he holds the prepared bow and arrow, is serious and not at all childish. We can see Cranach's monogram, with a dragon sign and corresponding date to the left from figures that are rendered with actual illusion. The Madonna by Cranach looks like a princess with golden hair, as if she were taken from old German legends. Cranach set down time and time again the ideal type of female beauty of the period, the bulging forehead, narrow and wide-spaced eyes, oval face with sharp chin and long curly hair. Such a theme as the Last Judgment was traditional in the decorative system of the medieval church since the Romanesque age. The image of Christ, sitting in a mandorla on the globe of the world, was often depicted separate from the scene of the Last Judgment, but charged with its meaning.
The artist represented that moment of the legend when Christopher was carrying the child over the river. Elsheimer was one of the first to introduce into European art the imagery of night scenes charged with moonlight. The outlines of figures and trees on the banks are almost diffused and blended with the low-key darkness of the setting. The still life of Christopher Paudus, painted in the last years of his life, shows no connections with any esteemed models, but on the contrary, demonstrates a direct contact with nature that was rare even in Dutch works, though they always served as models for German artists. At an early age, Paudus was a pupil of Rembrandt, whose influence dominated his work for a long time. But gradually on his return home, he was capable of elaborating his own manner, even in those genres which were primarily characteristic of the Dutch school. The silver-gray palette of Paudus, the mobile as if vibrating atmosphere of his still-life pieces, as well as the soft chiaroscuro handling, aimed at concealing all sharp edges, represent the best achievement of the German school of painting in the 17th century. Nevertheless, Paudus's talent did not meet with due respect from his contemporaries, connoisseurs as well as artists. He had no successors in the German art of that time, like the other most talented German painters. Applied art happened to become a sphere where German craftsmen proved capable of competing with French masters. In the 17th century, French workshops played a leading role in Europe, whereas in Germany, the progress became noticeable by the end of the 17th century. After its long retardation, this country gradually returned to more active contacts with other European centers of applied art which is why just at that time the Baroque style found its way into German applied art. The purely German traditions of wood carving received new life in the works of masters from the town of Eger. They invented the original technique of intarsia in which the Hermitage cabinet was executed. Panels with inlaid parts of different woods were widely used in the furniture decoration of the 17th century. The innovation the craftsmen of Eger made was the execution in relief that caught the light and imparted rich textural effects characteristic of the same cabinet in the Hermitage. Furniture from Eger, which was made of black wood and decorated with inlaid panels, was well known and popular, not only in German lands, but also in other countries. The sumptuous ceremonial life of all European courts and nobility in the Baroque age gave an impetus to the intense development of new types of palace utensils. In Augsburg, a German town famous for its many skillful silversmiths, the family of the Billers proved to be the best workshop during the whole century. The most outstanding master from this family was Johann Ludwig II, whose works are in particular prominence in the Hermitage collection. The abundance of forms and motifs, crowded ornaments, contrasting tones and colors, all these qualities, characteristic of the work of the Augsburgian master, Lorenz Biller II, are also typical features of the Baroque style. The chief artistic motif in the decoration of this jug in the Hermitage collection is the unusual conjunction of its gilded surface and the superimposed vegetable ornament of ungilded silver. Another work of the Augsburgian masters, the toilet set executed by Johann Ludwig II for Russian Empress Anna Ianovna, 
is a unique masterpiece of applied art. It includes 49 objects, from a big mirror and washing set to a small handbell intended for calling a servant. Executed in one style, they are diverse in their shapes and ornamentation. The so-called platemanage sets had a direct function, that of a candlestick set. They were an excellent adornment of any gala dinner. They included, as a rule, not only candlesticks, but also a bowl for the refrigeration of wine bottles and objects for spices and drinks. When decorating such utensils, the master could allow the most fantastic forms and combinations of motifs, as well as of different modes of metal treatment, demonstrating his brilliant craftsmanship. In the second half of the 18th century, however, the admiration for Rococo gave way to a general interest in antiquity. It was the age of neoclassicism, with its ideal of noble simplicity. The inspirer and theorist of this new cultural and artistic trend was Johann Joachim Winckelmann. Every sphere of art and artistic craftsmanship imprinted neoclassicism with its particular features. Clear construction and precise forms were characteristic of neoclassicist furniture. The greatest master of the second half of the 18th century, David Rentgen, won fame for his monumental bureaus, the forms of which recalled those of classical architecture. By means of special mechanisms, the drawers and secret sections were opened in turn, accompanied by melodies played by another mechanism. Anthony Raphael Mengs was a son of the court painter to the Elector of Saxony. His father prepared him from his early age for a painter's career, which is why his proper names were composed from those of Correggio and Raphael. At a rather young age, he made a self-portrait, having used the technique of pastel, which was very popular in the second half of the 18th century. Another picture by Mengs, Perseus and Andromeda, had a startling success with his contemporaries. In 1774, Mengs was elected president of the Academy of St. Lucas in Rome. Winkelmann called him Arts Restorer, as well as the German Raphael. Our only possibility to become great, and if possible, inimitable, is our ability to imitate the ancients. This motto of Winkelmann sounds quite distinctly in our mind as soon as we look at a picture of Mengs, where all the depicted figures recall definite classical models. In the compositional treatment of Perseus, we can discern a likeness with the famous ancient statue of Apollo in Belvedere. Candlesticks were used not only for their practical purpose, but to a great degree as an important adornment for ceremonial dinners. Candlestick decoration opened the way for the craftsman's fantasy. Here they are twisted like flower stems, while the central figures and garlands form a tracery steeple surmounted by a crown. This gold toilet set was commissioned for the Russian Empress in the late 1730s, and it can be considered one of the best pieces of Baroque applied art. 
There are 49 objects, including a big mirror, washing set, a handbell, and others. They are executed in the same style and attract attention with their various forms and ornamental motifs. This skillful piece of German decorative art reflects the typical features of the Baroque style. Abundance of forms and motifs, crowded ornaments, contrasting tones and colors. The chief artistic motif in the decoration of this jug is the unusual conjunction of its gilded surface and the superimposed vegetable ornament of ungilded silver. This type of composition, with panels inlaid with different species of wood, was widely used in furniture decoration of the 17th century. The innovation which the craftsmen of Egger made was the relief execution, which caught the light and imparted rich textural effects characteristic of Baroque art. The craftsman turned to a drawing of F. Boucher for this subject, connected with Moliere's play, The Sicilian, or Love as a Painter. A small porcelain group is imbued with expressive movement, while its composition displays an excellent sense of material. Candler used all the potential of plasticity, characteristic of porcelain, and punctuated its soft whiteness by the emphasis of some rich colors. This piece, painted at an early age, demonstrates the innate genius of Mengs for painting. He used the pastel technique, which was popular in the first half of the 18th century. This painting, at the moment of its creation, won great success. All the figures were painted under the influence of determinant classical images. The posture of Perseus reveals a clear likeness to the famous statue of Apollo in Belvedere. The still lifes of Pottis, with their dominant silver-gray tonality, atmosphere throbbing with movement and soft chiaroscuro formulas, rank as the best achievement of German painting in the 17th century. The motif of putty, or plump winged children, who in European painting, especially of the Baroque period, usually accompanied ancient gods and heroes fallen in love with any personage of mythology, 
were widespread in the art of that time. Here such a figure plays an unusual role, that of gravedigger, which could be seen as a playful hint of mortal love. Rentgen ranks as the most important furniture master of the second half of the 18th century. He was particularly famous for numerous bureaus or writing desks, which he executed in the forms of classical edifices. By means of special mechanisms, the drawers and secret sections were opened in turn, accompanied with melodies played by another mechanism. <laughs> A Russian statesman and diplomat, and one of the outstanding personalities of the Age of Enlightenment, sat for this portrait. He won respect and reputation in Europe, while still in his youth. Voltaire, in a letter to Catherine II, enthusiastically praised his great intellect, brilliant erudition, and refined taste for the arts. The romantic trend increased in German art and culture throughout the second half of the 18th century. The political backwardness of the country was in great contrast to the lofty ideals of its spiritual life, which were incarnated in the music of Johann Sebastian Bach, the philosophical works of Immanuel Kant, and the early literary writings of Johann Friedrich Schiller and Johann Wolfgang Goethe. The unknown subject of Anthony Graff in his Portrait of a Man shows the intense working of his mind. His hand holding a pen is prepared for writing. He has seemingly stopped writing for a minute to collect his thoughts or formulate them more clearly. This man was earlier identified as a bourgeois, then as Count Medem, but he is doubtless an example of the educated or enlightened people of the age, which is called the Age of Goethe. The work of Caspar David Friedrich is penetrated with the idea of the indissoluble unity of the natural world and the inner world of a human being. In the period of the Romantic movement, the German school of painting became deeply original turning into an important phenomenon of European artistic life. Throughout his lifetime, Friedrich painted primarily landscapes. Sea and mountains, stars, moon and clouds, trees and edifices or their ruins were under his brush not only real earth motifs, but an embodiment of general concepts related to questions of human life and providence. Friedrich worked in Dresden the renowned center of German Romanticism. Gradually he turned into the most typical and ingenious master of this artistic trend. In 1818, after his marriage and travel to Rügen, one of the islands in the Baltic Sea, Friedrich painted the picture on a sailboat, where he represented himself and his wife Carolyn on the sailboat's bow, intently gazing at the outlines of the distant land as if they wanted to discern their own destiny. The sailboat placed in the foreground seems to be drawn forward not so much by the force of winds as by the passionate rush of the souls of the people sitting in the sailboat's prow. The painter was constantly absorbed with the theme of contemplation of nature by man, as if the latter hoped to find in it a clue to the greatest enigma of life. This theme was incarnated in various works. In the sublime paintings, 
as well as in the miraculously beautiful sepia drawings. In the painting Sunrise Brothers, we can see people plunged into contemplation of nature, and the background, with its splendid distant view, acquires here particular meaning. In the majority of Friedrich's paintings, people are represented turning their back on the viewer. The unknown subject for this portrait has been identified at times either as an aristocrat, Count Medem, or as a bourgeois. However, it is beyond doubt that the artist represented an educated man of his time. We can perceive an aura of the brilliant epic of Schiller and Goethe. The artist was always absorbed with the theme of the contemplation of nature by man, as if one hoped to find in nature a clue to the greatest enigma of life. This theme found a reflection in various works, in the sublime paintings, as well as in the miraculously beautiful sepia drawings. The motif of a sailboat on the sea was one of the favorite images in the poetry of Romanticism. Represented in the foreground, it seems to move forward not solely by the force of the wind, but much more thanks to the passionate will of the people sitting on its bow and eagerly looking at a far yet unknown seacoast. coast. 